I think probably the best place to start, Brian, is with uh, uh, giving you the opportunity to explain why now um, and why you've decided to step up um, and uh, take on this, this daunting challenge of getting elected in Palo Alto. I think ultimately it just goes back to, I have a love for the city of Palo Alto. I was born here. Um, I was raised here. I've lived here almost my entire life, except for a few years. Um, so I just have a deep uh, understanding and respect and love for the city. And so that was what was underlying my motivation to run. But more acutely, I, I would say that it was the Castilea project that really uh, kind of raised my attention to the fact that uh, I think that there's some things that need to change about the way the city council is interacting with the city and with the residents and especially with outside developers. And so um, that and I would have ideally probably gone to the Planning and Transportation Commission, but I, I applied for that three times and was denied. So I figured I'd just go straight to the voters this time. Um, and was there anything besides the Castilea um, project that sort of caused you to decide this was the, the time to, to take this step and sort of bypass the normal commissions and so on? Well, like I said, I tried the normal commission path and um, and it didn't work out. So that's what kind of prompted me to try this. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's other things than just Castilea that definitely showed me uh, that we might be headed in the wrong direction. Um, and some of the projects that are being proposed, I think don't really fit the Palo Alto that I know um, and concern me a bit. Why don't we get into those? What are, what are the things that concern you? Um, I really don't think we should raise the height uh, limit in for, uh, town and country. Uh, that's one new project that I just heard about. Um, I think that that would totally change the, the feel of that area. I mean, I live and I grew up actually right next to town and country. And um, I like that it's such a quaint, small, uh, two-story uh, buildings. And to put in a, a, not a high rise, but a short rise um, in that area, I think would change the entire dynamic. So you, you were born and raised here. So you have strong uh, history of Palo Alto and how it's changed. Is there anything about how it's changed that that has met with your approval and enthusiasm? Um, yeah, definitely. I think that in terms of uh, just city services overall, I think that it's it's much better than when I was growing up. Um, just just if you look at the Enjoy catalog, you can see how many more uh, events that and uh, sports and the facilities. Ever in that term, in that regard, I think the city's done great. It's more about uh, going forward and specifically with the development. So can you can you elaborate on that? What what kind what what kinds of development have you seen occur in Palo Alto that you would have liked to not have happened? Well, I guess what I've really seen is other cities. I've seen Mountain View on San Antonio Road, and um, I would hate for that to come to Palo Alto. Um, those just kind of uh, removing. I mean, it used to be kind of a small shopping mall and now it's just, uh, it looks like a wall of apartments. And I toured them at one point just because I was curious and they're all very tiny. Um, I just don't feel like that's the Palo Alto that I would want to be uh, putting forward. Well, but if you're running in the city of Palo Alto, then you're, you're running to prevent, you, you want to see those things not happen in Palo Alto. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, and I think also the Castilea project feeds into my decision to run and that mm -hmm. I think that the city council and the city in general should be listening to residents more. I think that uh, the local, re I, when I moved here, it was already a couple of years into the Castilea fight, but um, they had been fighting for five years against this project and it didn't seem like the city was very responsive to their very reasonable concerns. And so I don't think that that's how things should be. Do you think the city voters would have uh, voted against Castilea expanding as was approved by the council or uh, I assume if it, would, you... if it was taken directly to the voters? Yeah. I, I think that they would have sided with the residents because I think everyone can kind of uh, put themselves in the shoes of residents who are about to have their neighborhood completely changed and nobody's going to want that.
So, um, Brian, it sounds like um, there are a lot of changes going on um, in the city that um, that you would rather not happen. I think you described it as sort of a Santana Row esque yeah. development, which is is a great you know a visualization. Everyone knows like the 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 residents on the top and like the the retail on the bottom. Um, so. I think that puts you in a uh, in somewhat of a difficult position, given that state uh, laws have just been passed. Um, so I guess my first question for you is: Would you support the city then, you know, joining some sort of a lawsuit to revoke SB nine and SB ten? Is that is that is that even something that, if you were elected, that you would want to to push for? If it, if there was some reasonable lawsuit that was being proposed, I that would be a great idea. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so short of that, then we have kind of what we have <laughs> in terms of like yeah. uh, the, the mandate, 6,000 more units to plan for. So how do you kind of go in thinking uh, about the responsibility um, that you would have as a city council member to be meet, meeting state mandates, but also trying to make sure that the character, if you will, you know, the look of and feel of Palo Alto doesn't, how do you square that, you know, yeah. in your head? So, well, first off, what I have issue with about Santana Row isn't necessarily the mixed retail uh, housing aspect of it. It's more of the upscale, uh, just a Gucci store next to a Prada store. I don't think that that really fits the ethos of Palo Alto. And so that's more what I was taking issue with. I think that the way that we're going to get to 6,000 housing units is obviously going to be a lot of mixed uh, development. I mean, we should probably be converting office space downtown to housing above retail, um, obviously, the Coverly plan is going to have some housing. I think it's going to have it's going to take adding housing all over the city, and a lot of it's going to be converting office space to housing because, I mean, obviously, we need housing more than offices at this point. And it, part of it's going to be probably developments that I'm not too happy about, but I think that there's a way that we can find a compromise and and still preserve Palo Alto. So, Brian, um, housing is a something at Coverly that most of the neighbors are vehemently opposed to. So how do you square your views about Castilea with your views about putting housing at Coverly? I honestly didn't know that the neighbors were actually opposed to that. Um, that, that changes things for me. I would want to understand why that is and see, obviously, if there was a way to work around whatever the issue was. Um, but I would definitely have a significant hesitation if that's how they felt. So on a, on a broader level, what, where would you, how would you describe your philosophy regarding balancing the desires of an immediate neighborhood to the community's interest at large? If, someone, if something, let's say, for example, grade crossings where there may be immediate neighbors of the tracks that have strong objections to one or more of the alternatives, but the conclusion of many is that for the city overall, um, the, what they object to is um, better, a better outcome. How, how do you, how would you deal with that? I mean, I think that there's definitely, obviously, an argument to be made that if something's going to benefit the entire city, then that can overrule the local uh, residents. Mm -hmm. I guess I reject some of the uh, ideas that increasing housing overall benefits the city and therefore should override individuals that live in that area. I don't really necessarily subscribe to that. I do subscribe to the idea that, um, you know, rails uh, separating the tracks from the, from the road, that does benefit everybody. So that's one of those cases where, you know, some preference has to be given even at the expense of the local residents. But ideally there'd be a way to minimize that impact on whoever lived in around there. And you're a supporter of tunneling the tracks. Um, that is a, a proposal, of course, that has long since been, been put down. Um, would you try to resurrect it? I don't know if I would try to resurrect it. I just, that is definitely my uh, preferred method. I think that when you're looking at Palo Alto 50 years from now, which option is going to leave us in the best place? And I think it's going to be a tunnel. Um, I think any other option is going to continue to pay consequences year after year um, in terms of traffic or noise. Uh, so long term, I think that the best option would have been a tunnel, but I recognize that that has been shot down and is no longer an option now. So um, I'm not going to, I wouldn't get stuck on that one. I would be able to move forward because ultimately we need to make some decision because it's been way too long and we're 
running out of time. So I wouldn't want to slow down the process even more by resurrecting that. So, okay. So what is your next best solution? Um, I think that I don't probably know enough about the other options right now to be able to answer that question. I, I've seen some proposals and uh, they all have their pros and cons. I, would, I don't know if I feel comfortable really answering that yet. Do you, do you uh, are you um, more drawn to one over another? I think that for Churchill, I wouldn't want to close uh, Churchill to traffic. I think that that would cause a significant increase in traffic elsewhere. And that I, I would want to see the studies that have been done and really dive into that deeper before I uh, definitively made a decision to rule that out. But from what I've heard so far, I think that that is not really a, a good option. Okay, and I'm sorry to bounce around and go back to Castellea for a second, but I'm wondering, given how strongly opposed you were to uh, the ultimate outcome, what were you hoping for as an outcome? What were you wanting to see happen? I mean, I guess uh, I'm not necessarily that opposed to the to the outcome that happened. It was more the process that I really am uh, upset about. The fact that residents had to fight so hard to get there and uh, a lot of the games that were played, uh, Castellet threatening to sue the city and the city kind of just rolling over. Um, I just, I don't like the precedence that it set and I don't like the process and how hard the residents had to fight to get any kind of concessions. It just, it was a dynamic that I don't think is appropriate where um, a large entity with money was able to basically bully all of the neighbors. Um, that's what I take more issue with. Um, ultimately, I would have preferred that there not be an underground garage. Um, I think that they should have uh, worked harder to preserve trees. But ultimately, I also don't think that they should have been given an enrollment after, you know, not following their existing uh, guidelines for so long. I, I think that we're rewarding bad behavior there. So do you feel there's something that needs to be fixed if you were elected to the way the staff um approach this issue, uh, the way the council and the political process dealt with it? Yeah, I think that, um, I don't know the, I don't remember the specifics, but city staff made a recommendation in, in terms of treating the garage as a basement and therefore allowing square footage exemption. What I don't remember the exact specifics, but whatever it was made absolutely no common sense to anyone that you would have said that to. I mean, it just didn't make sense what they were doing. And it seemed like city council just accepted what the staff was recommending, um, I would have pushed back. I would have pushed back and said, this doesn't make sense. Well, there were some that did that and that that led to some of the compromise that emerged from in the in the end. Uh, it sounds like your your main concern was the, the length of the process and that sort of adversarial acrimonious way in which you feel Castellea handled it. Yeah, and I mean, Castellea is gonna, you know, obviously, work to advance their interests and that that's okay. I just would have liked to see the city stand up for the residents uh, a little bit more rather than residents having to do it all on their own. Would you have favored the school leaving and that area being redeveloped into housing? I think that would have been a great option. I don't think it was a very realistic one. Um, and I do think the Castellet adds a lot to the community. I like the Castellet is there. Um, mm -hmm. I just don't think that they need to expand um, in terms of enrollment. And, and were you involved actively in the in the opposition effort there among the neighbors? Um, like I said, I, I moved, I, I, I purchased this house about towards the end of that whole struggle. Uh, so I got involved just on the cursor. Uh, I had a sign up, I would read the emails, I went to one city council meeting regarding it, but um, I think a lot of the struggle and fighting had already taken place by the time I moved in. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to bounce back to another topic. So you uh, <laughs> mentioned uh, mixed use housing, um, uh, mixed use and retail, kind of that concept um, as a way to add housing uh, throughout the city. Um, some people talk about area plans and you know how it's great to have this vision uh, first before you start adding uh, different development. Is that something that you, you kind of buy into, or do you think it should be just happen more organically when when developments are proposed? Um, I think that if that makes sense, I, I, I would say like uh, the area plan for Ventura area where Fry's is, I think that that's an obvious one where it makes sense to have it more planned out. Um, 
Is that because of the the the, the size of the area yeah, or the different mix of just the scope of uh, the development that's going to be taking place? Okay. Um, are there other areas in town that you would uh, see that as being a, a viable kind of approach to development? I think everywhere that we're trying to spur development, so downtown along El Camino, San Antonio, um, mm -hmm. I think it would be appropriate there. Mm -hmm. um, some people are talking about the sort of flagging um, business in downtown and Cal Ave. Would you support some sort of zoning changes to see more housing come in there? Because those, I mean, they're both... It, they're both residential as well as commercial. Um, say the question again. What do you? Uh, would, do you support some sort of like zoning change that would allow more housing to come in to, to, to California? Yeah, downtown and Cal Ave as well to, yeah, to boost. Definitely. You would. What, what would that look like? Because I definitely. Think, I, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, I definitely think conversion of uh, the street parking into housing makes a lot of sense. Um, at, put parking either into new garages, uh, consolidate it, or put it even underground garages if possible. I don't know about the geography, but um, I think that's one way that it would look. Mm -hmm. So the, the parking garages the, that are currently there, the public? The street parking, uh, you know, maybe consolidate all of the street parking lots into one new parking garage, and then we could add new housing, yeah. Did, did, I, I don't think you meant put housing on the street parking is, is that what you're suggesting? Uh, what yeah. Do you mean on parking oh, lots? I mean surface. Parking lot. surface. Surface parking. parking. Okay, yeah. so you're you're <laughs> suggesting that on the surface lots that the city has, the housing could be developed on those lots. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. So on this, in the same topic of of housing and and development. Um, What's your view on to what extent density and, and parking and height limit um, incentives or considerations ought to play in attracting that development? Are you prepared to increase the current 50 foot height limit in order to make a more potentially viable um, housing development? I am prepared to do that, but only in locations where it actually fit the surrounding buildings. So, um, I think that well, since we have a 50 foot height limit, <laughs> yeah. it would be hard to find that, except in downtown where you before the 50 foot height limit, we have a number of apartment buildings that are that are well beyond 50 feet. Exactly. So I think that would definitely be one place where I would uh, support expanding uh, the height limit. And then also if it was an area that was. Uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I definitely there are places where I think it would be appropriate. But in general, no, I'm not in support of expanding the height limit uh, as a blanket policy at all. What about on the El Camino, um, the stretch of El Camino and south of Page Mill, for example, which has been talked about as an area that is not particularly uh, serving the community with, with anything other than a lot of um, inconsistent retail and service businesses? I'd want to talk to the local residents and from what I've, who I've talked to so far, they have concerns and I think that they're pretty valid in terms of the traffic impact that it would have on them. Um, I think it would be, it would come down to uh, the details, I guess. But I think don't you think you're going to run up against neighbor concerns no matter where you attempt to locate new housing? And, and isn't so, that a given? Um, hopefully not, not if you do it right, maybe, but um. I, I really reject the premise that it, adding new housing is more important than uh, existing residents' concerns, I guess. But I understand we have to add the housing, so it's it's going to be a challenge, no doubt. Uh, I assume you're a big proponent of ADUs and, and the role that they can play in adding to the housing stock or not? I don't think that they're going to move the needle very much, but uh, in general, I am supportive of it. And would you provide incentives for people to to uh, put ADUs in their property? Uh, incentives such as- Financial incentives, uh, loans. I think that the private market could probably handle that on its own. I don't, I don't know if the city really needs to get involved with uh, incentivizing it. Um, what about the incentive of lowering, not just for ADUs, but development in general, uh, lowering parking requirements? 
below current standards. Is that something that you would see as a, a worthwhile incentive to provide to developers? I think so, especially downtown where hopefully we can get workers who are also working downtown and who are going to ride the train. And so uh, cars aren't going to be their primary mode of transportation. I think we also need to bring back the shuttle program. Um, that's one that I used growing up. I used it uh, when I was living here and working downtown. So uh, I firsthand know that having a robust shuttle program allowed me to live here without having a car. Um, and without that shuttle program, I would have had a car. So. Ryan, as people have looked at both Mountain View and Redwood City and the development that they've done in the last decade or so, um, obviously from your earlier remarks, that hasn't resonated very well with you. I'm, I'm wondering, is there anything about what either of our neighboring communities have done that you have found kind of meets your test of good development that adds housing? I mean, I think that uh, in general, I'm definitely not supportive of the density that Redwood City has introduced to their downtown, but I am supportive of the overall uh, cleanup of the city that's occurred as a result of that. I think that it's a much, I mean, I never would have gone to downtown Redwood City probably in the past, but now I, I go there all the time. It's just a nicer downtown now. Um, so there has been benefits to the city as a result. I just, if... I lived there, I would have wanted them to keep the height significantly lower, and then I think it would be even better. Uh, before we leave the neighborhoods uh, idea, I know that you say that different neighborhoods want different things. That makes sense. Um, would you take that so far as to support district elections so that different areas to town have a different champion on the council? Is that something that appeals to you? I've never thought of that, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I... I can see benefits to that. I could also see, I, I'm not prepared to really say how I feel about that, I guess, but it's an interesting sure. idea, definitely. A, a lot of cities, including Menlo Park and Redwood City actually have, have been sort of forced or coerced into moving to district elections because of the, the laws that are basically making them vulnerable to litigation due to uh, basically, their current system's not reflecting the diversity of the community. Palo Alto has managed to skirt that so far, but, but that it's very much happening in many, many municipalities. I would wonder if there's really enough candidates to make that a viable uh, election then. But... It's, a really good, it's a really good point, and, and they're finding that in, in Menlo Park and Redwood City, there are some uncontested district elections. Mm -hmm. So somebody has filed and they're winning by acclamation in a sense. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it comes, the, this issue in Palo Alto comes up more for those who live in South Palo Alto. <laughs> yeah, that, that feel underrepresented on the, yeah, on the yeah, council. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and I, I've lived in South Palo Alto, so I can understand that. I mean, I, I understand that concern also. Um, I want to pivot uh, to fiber unless Bill had more questions. No, that's where I was gonna go too, so that's perfect. Thanks. <laughs> So, I mean, you're an entrepreneur and you've been in the high tech area. So I think you might have some opinions on this. The city has attempted for more than two decades to build a citywide fiber optic network and it's fizzled, I, I think maybe three or four times. So do you have any ideas? I, I think you do support it. So do you have ideas on how it can be implemented successfully this time and avoiding pitfalls of the past? I think it's just gonna take political will. Someone needs to champion it and push this through. I think everybody more or less thinks that it's a, it's a decent idea. Uh, some people support it more than others. Some people might not think it's the right time, but um, I think that there's enough political will to for it to get done. It just, somebody needs to champion it and push it through, finally. And there I seems to be a, a funding uh, allocation of resources question. Well, so. I feel like it will pay for itself eventually. So, um, I'm not too concerned about the funding aspect. There's there's ways to fund this, I think. Do you do you feel that given that AT&T already is is developing and building out a fairly significant amount of the city with fiber um, and it's available at a very reasonable price that this is a risk a financial risk that's worth taking for the city to to go up against a company as large as that? I 
don't think the AT&T is moving nearly fast enough. I, I don't know anybody who actually has access to the AT&T fiber network. Um, and I've asked a lot of people. So I think you do. Have you tried it? Oh, yeah. I try every couple of months. I check them and Comcast to see if I can get fiber yet. But well, that's interesting because I, I live about four blocks from you and we have fiber. Oh, well, lucky. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I and uh, I mean, just and you can imagine how long it's going to take the city of Palo Alto to implement fiber, even if everybody agreed it should be done. Right. I mean, ATT is not going to stand still with their with their work um, while that happens. Well, I remember when I got my first cable modem uh, uh, back in 1994 or so, that was through the city of Palo Alto and they, they managed it and uh, got us faster internet speeds than pretty much anyone else I knew in the entire country. So I think the city can do it. Okay. And you're supportive of the city running it as opposed to a third party? I think that I would like it to happen um, if it's ran by the city, the utility department, or uh, a third party, I'm not prepared to really state an opinion on that. Okay. Um, let's move on to retail and restaurants. I know that you're supportive of giving them some help, especially coming out of the pandemic, um, we have a bit of a patchwork sort of areas that have uh, street closures and people coming out for dinners and then places that look more like a ghost town. So what do you have in mind? Um, what are the next steps for the city if you were to be elected? What, what could the council do to really support retailers and restaurants? Yeah, another reason that I decided to run it was the loss of a lot of these uh, iconic places in Palo Alto. I mean, uh, the camera store that was on California Avenue, I used to go to all the time and then they left. Um, uh, Mr. Cho's, uh, just uh, Shady Lane. So many of these iconic Palo Alto places just got priced out. Now the old pros closing. I could go on and on really. I mean, there's so many of these iconic places are closing down, uh, not all because of uh, being priced out necessarily, but I think that that is a big role. Um, and I think that we're losing an important part of Palo Alto when these businesses leave because they have a legacy here and we need to support that as best we can. I'm not really sure what the right way to support them is, but they definitely need to be supported. Um, one of the ways that I think we can support the restaurants that we still have is we should close California Avenue. We should close maybe even University Avenue and not just close the streets, but remove the streets and just put in uh, green space and uh, you know, amenities and benches and tables and turn it into a, a plaza. Um, I think it would be safer than having the traffic on the street. Um, it would help those restaurants and businesses. The businesses that think that maybe, you know, it might decrease their uh, people going to their stores because people can't park right in front of them. I, I don't think that that's accurate because I think it's going to bring so much more foot traffic to the area. So, and I, I think residents would just love it and enjoy it. So I think that's something we should definitely pursue. So there, therein you have a situation, I think, where residential support for an idea such as you just outlined, especially on California Avenue, I think there's complications with University Avenue, but mm -hmm. um, I think would, would be overwhelmingly supportive of the idea. But there is tremendous pushback among the non-restaurant uh, businesses on the avenue to doing that. So there you have a case where um, the, the, the residential neighbors are in support of something, but the business, the business neighbors are not. How, how would you try to reconcile that and making a decision? And is this something you feel strongly enough about that you'd walk the street and actually try to understand, how, you know, what can be done to, to um, offset these business concerns? Well, I, I think that if their concern is the loss of uh customers just because of the parking and, or I think that that's probably not accurate. And so I want to educate them on uh, maybe to see it a different way, but I'd also want to listen to a lot of these small businesses and see what their concerns actually are. Cause maybe there is a different concern that they have, um, but I can't think of it, what it would be, but there might be something. So I would want to talk to them and really understand the problem more, but in general, if it came down to choosing between residents and, uh, and even, legacy small businesses, I would, I would side with residents. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I think there's certain stores like the paint shop and and places like that that I wouldn't think would see a value to closing down the street entirely, even though they've now lived with it for almost three years. Um, they've got parking behind them. And yeah, it, California Avenue in many ways is ideally suited to this because of the access from the from the backs of these of these businesses. Mm -hmm. But I think university, it could work also. I really do because um, I don't know about you, but I never drive down university. I mean, that's just uh, asking for it to be sitting in a line of cars. Um, so I think that the alternative routes can already handle the traffic. I think that there is a way to make it work, but it would take a creative solution. It would take a lot of education and a lot of listening. Brian, I, I think in our forum, you were one of the candidates that actually was prepared to give a grade to Ed Shikata. <laughs> Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. And what was the grade? Uh, C. Okay, that's what I that's what I thought. So could you speak to that a little bit and what you based that grade on and your general view of council manager relations? I, I gave him that grade for um, a number of reasons. I guess just because I... I assume that the entire city staff is going to kind of follow his lead. And so um, I grade him for just the way that all of the city staff are, are operating or at least uh, interacting with council. And so uh, part of it comes back to the Castilea issue. I think that uh, their staff isn't being directed to prioritize residents' concerns over maybe the person submitting a proposal. Um, so I, I don't know if the fault for that lies on council or if it goes to the city manager. Um, I also feel like over the last uh, five years, especially, but even 10 years, the city has become uh, kind of an entity of its own, much more so in, in terms of uh, uh, just with the zoo. Uh, that used to be a, the junior zoo, used to be a really quaint little uh, zoo where you could go and you could look at raccoons and it was just a, a really fun place. The kids loved it. Everybody loved it. It was free. You could just stop in on your way while taking a walk. And I don't think anyone had a problem with that zoo. It was perfect for Palo Alto. Now we have this, this San Jose style zoo where you have to pay, you have to plan it out ahead of time. You have to schedule your trip, you know, a week in advance. The, uh, all of the exhibits ha have a name associated with the person who donated money for it. I just don't, that's not the Palo Alto that I know. And I don't think it's the Palo Alto that a lot of people know. So, I mean, part of that probably goes to the council, but I think that as city manager, he's hasn't necessarily stopped and realized that he's not in San Jose anymore. He's in a different town and, and tried to get a gauge of what that town is and what the people here want. Do you sense that there's tension between this notion of preserving the way it's always been and creating a more dynamic, exciting place. I mean, do, do you do you feel that tension in the community? I feel like most people, I think it's pretty dynamic and exciting already. I mean, this is the birthplace of Silicon Valley. I mean, there's so much going on here. The city has so many events, so many activities. I, I don't know if, uh, really we're trying to add more activity or di di uh, make it more dynamic. I think in some ways we might uh, be threatening that even just by making higher density uh, tends, you might not get to know your neighbors as much. Uh, we might be overwhelming the activities. I know already it's almost impossible to sign up for tennis classes at Rinconada Park. Um, and that those kind of things would only be getting worse. So maybe it would become a less dynamic place. I don't know. Do not even have any questions that you want to ask, Brian? Let me slip one in there. Right okay, before sorry. Shinati. Um, so how would you, we were talking about the city staff, but how would you rate the job of the current council? And is there some sort of dynamic, besides listening to residents, which uh, a point well taken, um, that you would like to change, just how they interact with each other or how they interact with city staff? There's something of the current council that you have a critique for? The only critique I would have would, it would be to push back against city staff and uh, uh, rather than just accepting some of their recommendations. Because I know that there's been a lot of times city staff will make recommendations on what they think should happen. And, you know, 
obviously they do know what they're talking about. This is their job. They probably do make really good recommendations, but sometimes uh, maybe pushing back a little harder would be my only critique. But in general, I think that the council does the best job they can. I mean, I'm not really critical of the council. Just a quick question, just in light of the fact what you said about not wanting to change things too much because Palo Alto is already pretty happening. Um, they've been talking for years about building a history museum and that's something that might require uh, the council to throw some money into and uh, whoever's elected is probably gonna get to decide, you know, how much to contribute and whether the project could proceed. Um, what are your thoughts on the potential history museum at Roth Building? I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I know I've been a big fan of the Palo Alto history and their website for a long time. I mean, almost every week I go on and look at the old photographs they have and stuff, and it's fascinating. I think that Palo Alto has such a unique history and we should definitely preserve it. Adam, anything that you wanted to ask before we wrap this up? Yeah, sure. Um, so Brian, as I am entering here, uh, taking over from Bill at Embarcadero Media, um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on as a Palo Alto Weekly and how well you feel it serves Palo Alto um, and whether or not there are any suggestions you have about what we could be doing more of, less of, better, any, any feedback you have? You know, I've, I've definitely read the Palo Alto Weekly pretty much my entire life, um, but I've never really sat down to really think about the Palo Alto Weekly nearly as in depth as uh, until now when I'm running for the election. And now it's like Palo Alto Weekly seems to be a daily, uh, <laughs> something that's brought up daily now. Um, and the more that I've learned about it over the last month or two, uh, the more I've come to respect it, I'd say. So I think that it's actually a tremendous uh, resource for this community. It's in the whole organization is, I, I had previously never even really realized that the Almanac and uh, Palo Alto, they were all one parent company. So, I mean, I've actually learned a lot over the last two months, I'd say. So just to follow up on that, it sounds like you were not a regular reader before. Why not? No, I definitely was a regular reader, just not, uh, I would definitely read it when I was at Izzy's waiting for my bagel. Um, I would read, you know, the, the top stories. I would read it online whenever I see it in my newsfeed. I just never, um, and I guess during the pandemic, I started reading it a lot more also. Uh, that was the first time that I subscribed to it online. Uh, but I definitely never really took the time to understand the organization until just the last couple of months, I would say. Okay. Well, let me know if you have any other thoughts. <laughs> Can I ask one more question? Yeah, Sorry. go for it. Yeah, about public safety. This is something that I kind of asked at the forum, but I think most candidates didn't really answer um, about <laughs> what Palo Alto could do better um, about fair and unbiased policing. I know you and many others talked about kind of staffing issues and overall kind of crime trends, but uh, just specifically about like fair and unbiased policing. Do you think Palo Alto is doing well? Do you think there's room for improvement? And what, if anything, uh, could be done to improve if that's the case? I, I think the staffing is a big part of it. I know the property crime right now is just basically being ignored. Um, and that is probably a reflection of not having enough officers to investigate those kind of crimes. Um, which is just gonna to lead to more of those crimes. So we definitely need to restore their staffing levels. Um, I think that the decryption of the police radio is a tremendous step in the right direction. I've actually been broadcasting the police radio for about five or six years now online and archiving it so that um, you can go back and look and listen to it during this particular time period. Um, and so it went dark for about a year. And so now it's back online, which I'm really happy about. But uh, I'm not really clear, like, so do you think just adding staff is gonna help fair and unbiased policing? I mean, oh. it's, it's not like gigantic police departments don't have that problem. I, I, I'm not sure I see the exact correlation between more staff and fair and biased. Well, I guess it needs to be the right staff, obviously. Um, and from everything that I've learned about Andrew Binder, I think that he is, uh, he has the right uh, mentality and hopefully hiring will go in the right direction. I've, you know, firsthand experienced, uh, you know, some questionable policing in the city. So, so I think that uh, it would be great if it was to improve, definitely. And I think, the, I think accountability is a big part of that. Uh, them releasing stats, 
them releasing their service uh, interaction log in real time, unencrypting the police radio. I think that when officers know that they're being watched, then they're going to obviously behave better. But it also would be even better if we didn't have to rely on uh, them feeling like they're being watched to behave well if we just hired the right people. And I think that hopefully that's the direction that the police force is going in. One of the things that gets in the way of um, getting rid of uh, police officers who really don't belong in that field is um, the binding arbitration process for uh, disciplinary action. Would you favor doing away with binding arbitration in Palo Alto? I would have to learn more about it, honestly. I don't think I have enough information to make a, much of a decision on that. Okay, fair enough. Well, thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate your uh, your being here and for having the courage to to run and uh, uh, wish you good luck in the campaign. Thank you so much. And thanks for the time. Yep. Thanks, Brian. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.